Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding Complexities of Commercial Sexual Exploitation. My name is Carissa Rano, and I'm with OJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. As your technical host, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. For those of you wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the Q&A pod area. Click on the name of the file and then click the download button. During today's webinar, there will be a Q&A session where the presenter will address some of the questions posed during the presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A pod as they arise. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute and help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will provide it with a link to a brief survey about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to assist in future planning and training. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye on your email for your certificate. And finally, this event will be archived in approximately three weeks on OJDP's online university at www.ojdpou.org, where you can also view past webinars. Again, thank you for joining us today. I will now turn it over to our moderator for today's webinar, Kristen Treffa. Hi, thank you, Carissa. As you said, my name is Kristen Trufa, and I'm the Associate Director at MENI. I will be moderating today's conversation. I say conversation as we have incorporated several opportunities for you all to contribute through polls, chats, and word clouds. The more interaction, is, the more interaction there is, the more robust of a knowledge sharing environment we can create. So please grab those opportunities as they're presented to you. We will also break once during the presentation for questions briefly, and we'll leave a lot of time at the end for additional questions and answers with our presenter. Today's discussion will also include information specific to mentoring for child victims of commercial sexual exploitation and domestic sex trafficking. Many is the national TNTA provider for grantees of Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention that provides this service, so we've integrated that work into this presentation. Let me tell you a little bit about MENI. MENI is the only national network of its kind that engages stakeholders across sectors to strengthen outcomes for youth and young adults at highest risk for victimization and delinquency. Our Center for Research and Innovation builds on MENI's history of effectively strengthening youth service programs and our continued deep connection to hundreds of organizations across all 50 states. MENI reaches over 12,000 providers per year and engages in some form of training, technical assistance, or consultation with about 3,000 of these folks annually. In addition, we have a membership of, of agencies that are youth service providers, which we engage with more directly to identify and replicate promising practices in the youth services field. Together, we are able to advance the work of organizations like yours in real time, raise the level of conversation around key issues in the youth services field, increase cross-sector communication, drive national research, and increase support for programs. Many have strong roots working with runaway and homeless youth programs, juvenile justice programs, mentoring programs, and programs that serve commercially sexually exploited children. As a part of doing this capacity building work effectively, many partners with leaders, researchers, and experts to ensure information is real time, informative, and accessible to human service providers. We find the experts, one of which I will introduce you to now. Wichita State University's Center for Combating Human Trafficking is a leader in this field. CCHT's mission is to empower our nation's capacity to provide effective prevention, assessment, identification, intervention, restoration, and aftercare prosperity responses in efforts toward ending abuse and exploitation. CCHT staff represent over four decades of combined personal, direct practice, advocacy, and research expertise in the anti-trafficking field. 
CCHT is unique in that they don't just believe in rescuing victims, but rather respecting, empowering, and promoting prosperity among survivors. CCHT does this work in a variety of ways, which includes direct service facilitation, education, training, technical assistance consultation, research, and policy development. As I mentioned earlier, many is the training and technical assistance provider for OJJDP's mentoring for children, child victims of commercial sexual exploitation and domestic sex trafficking initiative. OJJDP presently funds 12 diverse agencies to work collaboratively within their communities to provide mentoring to young people impacted by CSEC. Many in CCHT provide training and technical assistance to these agencies to support their success in creating positive outcomes for the youth and families they serve. In addition, many in CCHT conduct national dissemination activities, such as information sharing, trainings, such as this, resources and toolkits, and watch for an upcoming public awareness campaign. Our presenter today, Karen and Countryman Rose Warren, is a leader in the field. Her experience and education in the field make her a leader on its own. Her insights and passion for making a difference for those impacted by human trafficking make her an exceptional leader. Karen, can you introduce yourself and get this presentation and conversation started? Thank you so much, Kristen. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I've, I've been paying attention to who all is logging in, and I appreciate you joining us today, specifically as we wrap up uh, the, the, the month of National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So thank you again. As Kristen said, my name is Dr. Karen Countryman Roseworm. I am the founder and executive director of the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. My master's is in social work, as oftentimes folks want to know, and my PhD is in psychology. I am a professor with the School of Social Work as well. However, what I bring to the field and specifically to this work and this conversation is more than 20 years working with runaway and homeless youth and young people and adults who have survived and even overcome labor as well as sex trafficking. I believe that there is a bio posted for Kristen as well as myself, um, so I really encourage you to look at that. But I do want to just hit on professionally, um, I think it's important when folks have direct practi practice experience, and so I do bring more than 20 years of serving those who have, have been on the streets, who have been involved and in, subjugated to labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking to this conversation. And even perhaps maybe more importantly than education or direct practice experience is my own personal experiences of, of being born into a home where there was a lot of trauma, um, and then at the age of 13, finding that my mother um, had committed suicide. And I always say, you know, I am a survivor leader. I'm an overcomer. Um, and not just of one particular experience, but of systems of care, of systems of justice, and an overcomer of the streets. And I think that that knowledge is so critical to any conversation um, when working with those who are vulnerable and marginalized. Ultimately, I always tell folks I have had many Popeye moments along with opportunities, moments where I've, I've felt as though I've had all I can stand, I can't stand no more, but also moments where I've just been able to truly embrace life and live from a place of fullness. So I know what it means to operate out of desperation and hopelessness, and I know what it means to live life holistically. And so I want to lay that out there because that shapes my lens when having this discussion about uh, commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking, that I do see this as a human rights and a social justice issue. And I believe also that um, there is this potential for for full redemption, for full recovery, and vitality and prosperity is possible. And when we engage with high-risk populations, in fact, we should expect that. We should not expect that they're broken or damaged. Another point I wanted to touch on just very briefly is that, you know, it's not just me that's doing this work at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. We are a survivor-founded, a survivor-led, and a survivor-operated organization. Actually, we recounted the years after gaining some new staff recently, and cumulatively, we have more than 100 years of direct practice experience that we bring to this field. And I just want to shout out specifically to Bailey Patton Bracken um, and Risa Remert, 
Kristen Al, Allison Ferris, Tiana Charles, Kaylin Cheney, and Mark Masterson, my teammates who, who help us do this work every day. And, and we do that so that all communities around the world can be more equipped to engage in effective prevention and intervention um, efforts to end human trafficking. So in terms of the objectives today, ultimately we hope that you walk away today with a richer understanding of the definition of commercial sexual exploitation as well as domestic minor sex trafficking. We hope you have a better understanding of what puts individuals at risk for commercial sexual exploitation. And we hope to help expand your understanding of the impact of commercial sexual exploitation as well. Something that's very dear to my heart, we also hope that you recognize the strengths and resiliencies of those who have lived through, who have survived, and who have overcome commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And we hope to ultimately help you walk away with some actions and resources to give you some next step as you continue your great work in the field and in the anti-trafficking movement. So to kick us off, we have a little poll. We want to get some information from you all. And our question is, are you currently providing services to individuals who have been victimized by or who have survived commercial sexual exploitation? And you'll see there, there are three questions. And if you could just check on the one that applies to you. Are you currently providing services to individuals who have been victimized by or who have survived commercial sexual exploitation? Excellent. It seems like the numbers are coming in. And again, it's just as a presenter, always good to know who is who we're engaging with. And it looks like around half or so of you have, are already working with this population. Looks like about 35% or so is not currently providing services to individuals who have been victimized or who have survived. And close to 19, 20% of you are not sure. Excellent, thank you. Our next question is in a poll form as well. In what capacity are you serving individuals? who have been victimized by or who have survived domestic minor sex trafficking. Again, the next question, in what capacity are you serving individuals? And you'll see we have several potential responses from street outreach services to education, mental health, Perhaps you're working in the faith community or in the medical field. Excellent. Looks like we have quite a few folks in the mental health field. the justice field. Looks like I'm paying attention to some of the things that folks are typing in in public chat as well. Um, foster parents, same SART nurses, excellent. Thank you. So we have a wide array of experiences and multidisciplinary professionals who are joining us on the call today. Unfortunately, on calls such as this, it's very difficult from everyone. And I, I do know as a presenter um, that all of you have your professional experiences. And I appreciate you bringing those experiences to this call even today. Sometimes as we're listening, as we're learning, I think it's really important to consider three things. And I encourage you to do this, because oftentimes on, on webinars or even trainings, we have 
just a brief amount of time together, and it can feel like we are drinking water from a fire hydrant coming at us very fast. And so as we gather this information today, I encourage you to consider three things. Um, and I like to think of it as head knowledge, heart knowledge, and then foot knowledge. So first, consider as you're listening today, what are you learning? What information is new to you? What information is maybe relative to your practice? What about this knowledge could really impact your practice or make a different difference? The second thing in terms of kind of that heart knowledge, I want you to consider what you're feeling. What about this information and, and some of the conversations that we might have today really hits home for you? What emotions maybe uh, rise in you or emotions that you could tap into improve, to improve the way in which you practice? And then that third thing that, that I said we like to think of as foot knowledge, because of this information, because of the head knowledge and the heart knowledge maybe um, gained or further enhanced today, what can you do differently now? I'm sure many of you have gone to conferences where you get lots of great information, but then you get back into the flow of things and we forget to implement it. And so I really want you to maybe write down those three things and, and take some notes for yourself as soon as this webinar ends so that you can really put this information into action in new ways. So to get us started, we want to talk a little bit about language and definitions. We always say at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking that language ultimately shapes our paradigms, and paradigms influence the way in which we treat people, specifically this population. And I'm sure many of you have already realized that when speaking about commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking, there is a lot of language and there is a lot of definitions, specifically relative to the term commercial sexual exploitation or commercial sexual exploitation of children, CSEC, are the terms domestic minor sex trafficking, human trafficking, you know, I could go on and on. One of the terms, though, that I would really ask that we commit to not using is the term that I, I too frequently hear still after this many decades of anti-trafficking work of, of child prostitution or youth prostitution. And we really need to just stop using that terminology, specifically when speaking about minors. Commercial sexual exploitation of children ultimately includes crimes of sexual nature committed against minors and includes victimization for financial or other economic reasons. And it manifests in numerous forms, such as brothels, sex trafficking, mail order brides, sex tourism, pornography, what we have historically known as prostitution, stripping, lap dancing, phone sex companies, etc. But some of the most common forms of commercial sexual exploitation are sex trafficking, child pornography, and child sex tourism. So ultimately, sex trafficking is just one form of commercial sexual exploitation of children, or as I will call it throughout the rest of this presentation, CSEC. So sex trafficking is a form of human trafficking, also known as trafficking in persons. And human trafficking has been a federal crime since the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, otherwise known as the TVPA of 2000. It's oftentimes talked as its own category of violence, but I really think it's important that we situate this conversation on a larger continuum of violence. Human trafficking is ultimately a form of abuse and exploitation. It includes, um, it, it occurs internationally as well as domestically. So internationally, it occurs in and between countries outside of the United States, as well as into um, in moving people into and outside of the US. And then domestically means uh, trafficking within the United States. So in addition to occurring at an international and domestic level, it also occurs for labor trafficking or for sex trafficking. And I just want to stop and take a moment to kind of read uh, these definitions of labor trafficking versus sex trafficking. So you'll see here, labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary ser servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. In sex trafficking, again, the recruitment, harboring, transportation, 
providing or obtaining of a person, but here's where it gets different, for commercial sex act in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. As you may have noticed when we reviewed those definitions, ultimately there's elements of human trafficking, and that has been um, broken down into an action and a means and a purpose. So on the next slide, you'll see that and we have it grouped into these categories of action, means, and purpose. Action includes recruitment, harboring, transportation, and the provision or the attempt to obtain someone. The means is through force, fraud, or coercion. And remember in those definitions that this force, fraud, and coercion is not required for minors. And for the purposes of labor, services, or commercial sex acts. You know, we do a lot of training on human trafficking uh, all over the world. And it seems that in the last decade, folks used to go very in-depth when defining human trafficking. And over the last few years, it seems like people want to rush through this. And so they oftentimes don't take the time to really think about, well, what do these terms in terms of the action really mean, recruitment, harboring, transporting? What do the, these terms in regards to means um, really signify in terms of force, fraud, or coercion? And so I want to take a minute that ultimately when talking about recruitment, this refers to the process by which a victim is sought out or pursued by a recruiter or a trafficker. And there's this intent to dehumanize and control their victim. Recruitment includes a multitude of methodical social as well as psychological grooming or seasoning tactics, including but not limited to things like bribery, flattery, threats, intimidation, cycles of abuse and affection, um, and isolation. And you have to really understand that And when you consider, you know, if you were a young person, you're on the streets, you're specifically and more susceptible to these recruitment tactics. Harbored refers to situations in which a victim is provided shelter or safety in exchange for performing a sex act or providing some form of labor service. Transported involves movement of victim from one location to another. And it's important to note that movement does not mandate a state or border crossing. A victim could even be transported within his or her own neighborhood or city or state. And then provided to someone means that a victim has been supplied to an individual for labor or sex. I think some other terms and, and definitions are important here, specifically um, considering this idea of being traded for anything of value. So this emphasizes that human trafficking can occur without the exchange of money. The exchange may include anything of value. So perhaps it's food, shelter, clothing, safety. It's still this commercial aspect that separates human trafficking from similar crimes such as sexual assault. And then in terms of force, fraud, and coercion, force largely includes physical or sexual threat and may involve physical restraint, confinement, or isolation, physical assault or beatings, sexual assault or rape. So for example, uh, force may include the kidnapping of an adult who, after physical beatings, is kept against their will and forced to perform labor or sex acts. Or fraud primarily includes the use of lies to manipulate and may involve false promises regarding employment, wages, working conditions, or other matters. So, for example, perpetrators may lure a victim with promises of well-paying work in a modeling industry, marriage, legal work in agriculture. However, once there is control, once that control is gained and options of escape are limited, they may require that they engage in labor or sex acts. And then coercion largely includes psychological fear and may involve threats of harm, harm to or physical restraint against any person. Specifically, maybe the victim themselves or someone they love, or someone the victim loves. 
Any, it includes any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that failure to perform an act would result in serious harm to or physical restraint of another person or the abuse or threatened abuse of the legal process. So for example, things like threats of arrest, deportation, withholding identification or other legal documents. So for example, a perpetrator may use coercion as a means of exploiting a victim by stating, if you try to leave me, I will kill your sister. Or perhaps the perpetrator might state that, if you attempt to escape, I will call the police and report you as an illegal immigrant. But again, I really want to clarify, though, is that the trafficking of a minor does not require this proof of force, fraud, or coercion. And this is by law. And I think this is an important discussion because despite the development of laws across uh, 50 states, as well as federal legislation, what we see is that we continue to have more and more situations where minors are picked up um, and they are criminalized when there's an inability to prove this force, fraud, or coercion. Ultimately, the law and the federal law recognizes the effects of psychological manipulation by the trafficker, as well as the effects of threat of harm often used by traffickers and pimps used to maintain control over their younger victims. Again, I want to point out that when you break down the, the definition into this action, means, and purpose, it really offers an opportunity to increase our capacity as providers across the country to better identify as well as serve um, and, and even collect data on human trafficking. Specifically with our LOTUS anti-trafficking model, we have what we call the human trafficking definition and identification tool, um, which we've used to help us again, better identify as well as keep track of, of data in terms of um, how many are being victimized by or through trafficking. Two additional components specifically in working with runaway and homeless youth that we've included in addition to the force, fraud, or coercion is this idea of lack of viable options and lack of accessible alternatives. And I think that's important to consider specifically when working with high-risk populations. You know, ultimately, there are multiple terms, and all of this can cause a little bit of confusion and maybe unnecessary complexity. But I think the things that are key and most important to remember is that the term commercial sex, the term commercial sex act is defined as the giving or receiving of anything of value to any person in exchange for a sex act. Sex act. And so domestic minor sex trafficking and CSEC includes survival sex and survival rape. It's ultimately the commercial aspect of the sexual exploitation involved in CSE and domestic sex trafficking that's critical to separating the crime of trafficking from sexual assault, molestation, or rape. It's ultimately a type of violence, and this includes verbal, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, which includes coerced or forced sexual acts in exchange for or the promise of money, drugs, food, clothing, shelter, or other survival needs. It's a transaction in which the body of a victim is treated as a commodity, something that can be stolen, something that can be sold. And this ultimately causes quite a bit of damage, um, often psychobiological damage. And as providers, it's critical that we, and again, ensure that we do not use such harmful terms such as prostitute. There is absolutely no such thing as a child or a youth, a minor prostitute. When we change our language, again, we can, we can then develop unity in changing our paradigm on how to treat this population in our society. This common language ultimately serves as a foundation for facilitating a comprehensive community and hopefully even national response and international response to this issue of abuse and exploitation. So we think it's really important to know your local definitions and. Um, Seek to even change them, perhaps. So with that, we have another poll. And Karen, oh, while we're pulling that poll up, we did have a question, if you could clarify for folks um, how this is different, where you have the note not required for minors. Can you talk about a little bit of the difference for minors and why you have that note there? So again, I have that note um, under force, fraud, and coercion, note not required for minors, because by federal definition, you do not have to prove force, fraud, or coercion in situations of commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. Great. Thank you, Karen. 
Again, I know I um, covered a lot in terms of definition, and we have another and we have another poll. So if we could click to that next slide for poll. When considering the language used in legislation or law, how many of you are aware of the unique characteristics and distinctions of your local CSEC or DMST definitions? I do not see the poll up. The moderator could please click to the next slide for the poll. Thank you. So again, the next poll is when considering the language used in your legislation or your local law, how many of you are aware of those unique characteristics? Considering the language used in legislation law, how many of you are aware of the unique characteristics and distinctions of your local CSEC DMST definitions? And you'll see there are a few different options for responses. Perhaps you did not realize that there were unique characteristics. Perhaps you're working to understand the unique characteristics. And then the last choice there is that you're very familiar. Okay, so it looks like we have the results in. Looks like about 40% did not realize there were unique characteristics. About 40% is working to understand. About 20% very familiar. Good. So building on this, we have a word cloud opportunity. And we'd like to just kind of capture, uh, specifically for those of you who are, are very aware of your local law and the language in your local law, we have two questions. And the first one is about strengths. So what are some of the strengths of your local law that you're seeing, specifically around this use of, of language and terminology? So I believe William is going to put up a, a poll where we're going to gather some information on the strengths, first and foremost. I know there's a lot of people on this webinar today, so I understand that um, there may be a little bit of lag on information and times it takes to put up polls and word clouds, but I believe that William may be helping us put up a word cloud in terms of a language and defining CSEC and DMST. 
We'd like to gather some information on strengths. Okay. You know what, perhaps we are having some issues pulling that up, so I'm going to just keep on moving on. Though I, I very much wanted to receive that information from you all in terms of strengths and weaknesses. I think it's just really important to explore um, you know, these distinctions within our own local community. We have been very active in working on legislation and law at a federal level as well as a state by state level and just even little nuances to be aware of, for example. So if you're talking about um, language, explore it with the, the, with the mindset and with the eyes of, could this potentially, um, could this language potentially cause criminalization of young people who are being sex trafficked, specifically if somebody doesn't understand the complexities within sex trafficking? So for example, oftentimes those of us who have long-term experience um, on the streets or working with survivors know that it is a, a rarity that a sex trafficking survivor, a C-sex survivor, never acts as a what is called as a bottom or somebody who, as I always say, does what they have to do to be raped one less time. And so we have to be careful that we don't then further criminalize somebody who's, who's acting at a survival. It is not to say that that is right. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a different and unique type of crime and activity on the streets again. And so we, what we regularly see is um, anybody really that's been CSEC or sex trafficked tends to have some experience of engaging in the subjection of somebody else as well. And so we need to look for that language. In addition, oftentimes we have language structured in a way that actually protects those who are driving the demands of the buyers of uh, commercial sex. So, uh, for example, in, in some, much of the law, even in our own law, when we've reviewed it, some of our concerns are around whether or not the buyer or the, the person seeking to purchase another person, the language says that they had to knowingly purchase somebody who was under the age of 18, when clearly, oftentimes, uh, those who are being sex trafficked do not report that they're under the age of 18 or their perpetrators do not post ads about them as though they're um, under the age of 18. They're, they advertise as though they're over the age of 18. So just again, keep your eyes open when you're, when you're reading legislation. Pay attention to that and get involved in changing your legislation. You know, I just wanted to quickly hit on scope of trafficking. You know, exact statistics that illustrate a clear picture as to the extent of human trafficking are often unavailable and even contradictory at times due to lack of funding, inconsistency in defining and identifying cases, the covert nature of the crime, invisibility of victims, and a high level of underreporting. So I really don't like to get into the specifics in terms of scope. I really encourage you uh, to try to figure out your local numbers, uh, working with law enforcement or your attorney general's offices. What we do know, though, is that human trafficking is a $32 billion per year industry. And it is um, a rapidly increasing crime. Some reports have said now tied with illegal arms trade as the second largest and second fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, both trailing only the illicit drug trade. Because ultimately, there's oftentimes less risk. And people are recyclable, whereas guns or drugs are not. And so it's extremely lucrative. Again, it's important to be aware of all this is specifically be aware of your local numbers because it illustrates the level of demand or the level of awareness and thus your nature or your, the nature of your response in your local community. I think any time we're looking at numbers, though, we have to be aware that we're more than likely just capturing just the tip of the iceberg as what research and data is showing is that only 2% of human trafficking victims and survivors are ever identified. And so while we at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking and many uh, value research, we ultimately believe that one person trafficked is one too many. If only one person is exploited, it's one too many. We know, too, that there are multiple forms and venues 
of commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. I believe Polaris Project just finished a report that demonstrated that there were more than 25 various types of commercial sexual exploitation. Some of the ones that we oftentimes see at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking are interfamilial pimping, intimate partner pimping. Of course, there's that historical pimp-based commercial sexual exploitation or gang-based. We see a lot of the survival sex or what we call survival rape occurring with our runaway and homeless youth. And we see this occurring in, in a variety of venues, from truck stops, where they oftentimes call them sex tours, to clubs and bars, residential brothels, shoeshine shops, and then, of course, uh, private parties, strip clubs, drug houses, and the streets. We also see this occurring in commercial sex shops, massage parlors and spas, at, through escort and dating services, as well as through a variety of web-based um, apps, social media sites, and through various forms of pornography. I'm sure everybody has been aware of all that has occurred with Backpage as well. And with this, the conversation about pornography and the exploitation of survivors through pornography is, is oftentimes left out of the conversation. And I think it's, it's time that we start having this. Ultimately, the making of and the material itself by nature and design is a commercial sex act. So when you consider pornography, there is an exchange of something of value to both the producer of the footage, for example, as well as the purchase, the purchaser and the viewer. So ultimately, pornography itself can be a direct venue of sex trafficking. And oftentimes we see that victims are being sex trafficked for the primary purpose of pornography production. In addition to that, pornography is frequently used as a gateway into trafficking, as often victims are filmed without consent as a means to gain control. Pornography is often used as an educational tool during the initiation and grooming. And pornography, we've also seen um, be used as a way to normalize commercial sexual exploitation during what's called that seasoning or grooming process. Pornography is oftentimes used as a means to advertise survivors and to communicate sexual requests desired by the buyers as well. Building on this idea that one is one too many, you know, and I, I, could, I could do a whole day presentation just on this alone, it's just important to realize that commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking looks a variety of ways. And I think right now, even when you consider the movement and thinking about um, the anti-trafficking movement's response to identify as well as more effectively serve those who have been victimized by or who have survived commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. We have to be careful not to um, inaccurately brand or box in this concept of what commercial sexual exploitation is. Because oftentimes perpetrators um, don't look the way that our, our media and our definitions frame them to look. And oftentimes those who are victimized by commercial sexual exploitation don't look a particular way as well. So again, we just have to be careful um, about this. Many of us see the, the, the pictures, for example, of where uh, a victim is chained or bound and she's tattooed and she looks sad and she looks dirty. And what we know, those of us working in this field, what we know is that oftentimes uh, the victim, the survivor is we faced, we're, we're faced with is angry and they don't want us to quote unquote rescue them and we have to realize that by law they are still a victim, they are still a survivor. So what puts individuals at risk for commercial sexual exploitation? You know we typically focus on individual situations um, of human trafficking or we think about risk rather at an at a individual or micro level. But it's important to understand that abuse and exploitation does not exist in a vacuum. It happens in a larger context, context with societal and cultural norms and risk factors as well as community norms and risk factors and then there's those familial risk factors as well. So things like um, 
overarching racism in a culture or gender inequality in a culture. That's a risk factor. It's a, it's a community norm and risk factor when there's tolerance of sexual discrimination and violence or great levels of sexual commercialization of women and children. And then we get into those familial risk factors and individual risk factors. So it's important to realize that human trafficking can and does happen uh, to people that come from a variety of backgrounds. However, what research is finding and has found is that it's correlated with poverty, with familial abuse, both physical and emotional, as well as neglect, problematic relationships with caregivers, drug and alcohol abuse. And there's been several studies um, that demonstrates that between 70 to 90 percent of domestic sex trafficking survivors have a history of child sexual abuse rape, or incest. We also know from the data that runaway homeless and street youth are at greatest risk for domestic minor sex trafficking and CSEC. So research shows that between 1.6, and this is a, a huge stretch, and 2.8 million youth run away each year. And one out of every three youth on the street will be lured into sex trafficking within the first 48 hours of leaving home. Well, and then you have to kind of consider, well, why did these youth run away? Oftentimes they were running from homes where there was various forms of abuse or exploitation. And so building on childhood trauma or other risk and vulnerability factors, the perpetrators of trafficking engage in a systematic desensitization process with their victims, often referred to as grooming or seasoning. I, I really love Andrea Dworkin stated in some of her early research working with victims of sex trafficking, that those early childhood experiences at home served as the boot camp for sex trafficking, for commercial sexual exploitation. Ultimately, traffickers exploit vulnerabilities. So I want to build on this a little bit. We did a study with over 258 survivors and from all of the information that we gathered, which we did a quantitative piece as well as a qualitative open-ended question piece with these 258 uh, young people who are at risk for who have been subjected to sex trafficking. And what we came up with was, what, was more than 560 risk-related responses and 132 resilience-related responses. So the first question that we asked these young people was, what do you believe puts you at risk for human trafficking? And you'll see on the next slide, we've developed a concept map, and it kind of shows what the variety of risk factors were. Um, and this kind of outlines for you how risks build on each other. So ultimately, the exposure to layers of risk factors and traumas lead to a vicious cycle of additional risk factors and traumas that increase vulnerability to CSEC or domestic minor sex trafficking subjugation. So this occurs at kind of two different levels. The exposure to and normalization of risk factors by primary social groups, and then the exposure to and normalization of abuse factors by primary social groups. Because of these exposures and normalization of risk factors or abuse factors, it kind of seems to create this lack of consistent um, or lack of constructive life foundation. This happen, happens at both a family level as well as a system level. And it affects a young person in terms of their risk thinking, in terms of their attitudes, and in terms of their behaviors. When an individual raised in a situation of trauma begins to have their own risky thinking, their own risky attitudes and behaviors, that's when they're at greatest risk for exposure to an, a, a direct assault by a trafficker. And that then leads to risk outcomes. So just to give you guys an idea, for example, so again, as we mentioned, and I more broadly mentioned these things, that most of us who have done research on risk factors for sex trafficking are aware of those basic, basic things, such as poverty or mental health or being runaway or homeless. But I think when we did this study and we were able to break it down a little bit deeper, 
it, it sheds some additional light. And I want to just read a, some quotes from survivors themselves on what put them at risk. So again, think about it. We were sitting with these young people and we just asked them, what do you believe put you at risk for trafficking? So one young lady in her pseudonym is Lacey talked about the drug and alcohol abuse in her home. And she said, so pretty much I was completely surrounded by people who drank and who did drugs. And I think that was a big factor because if I wasn't in that environment, then I would have had more than likely never been so deep and so early into drugs myself. In addition to exposure to risk factors, we talked with another young lady, her pseudonym is Tabitha, and she talked about how her mother was, had been sub subjected to commercial sexual exploitation and ended up getting pregnant by her trafficker. And so Tabitha was um, a result of that commercial sexual exploitation. And she was actually named after her mother's perpetrator. So we, again, asked her what it put her at risk, and she ended up saying, my mom knows who my dad was, but she named me after the guy that was pimping her, and that is how my name is Tabitha, because his name is T.R., and every time I look in the mirror, I think about that. So again, it's already shaping her identity. To illustrate further some additional risk factors, we pulled out this idea of abandonment. And a young lady that we met with ended up saying that pretty much everyone in her life had abandoned her. And she had had multiple foster care placements and talked about how you know, that caused her to have a difficult time attaching to people that she should attach to. In terms of abuse by a caretaker, another survivor quoted, just like they would hit me everywhere, like they'd get the bat and as soon as they would start hitting me. You could see the demon coming out of them. So yeah, they were scary. Even to this day, I'm scared of them. Some additional risk factors that we pulled out were lackadaisical parenting. So just parenting where uh, the adult in that young person's life was not engaged. They were not involved. A survivor quoted, that's how I started getting into drugs. My mother was gone all the time, and I didn't go to school. By the way, that young lady in particular, uh, her mother actually allowed, when she was 14, her mother allowed a 30-some-year-old man to move into her bedroom with her. And it was that guy who ended up becoming her trafficker. She was later found in a different state um, by law enforcement, was brought back home, and is now doing very well. In addition, we saw themes of home mobility and transitions, as well as, of course, street life and the inability to meet basic needs. The lack of unconditional adult support was another risk factor that we have found consistently through our study of, of what puts people at risk for sex trafficking, as well as a variety of other studies that have been done throughout, our, throughout the country. In terms of exposure to a normalization of abuse factors, there's another one, though, that oftentimes is undiscussed in literature that we found with the survivors that we met with. And that is uh, this specific issue of exposure to pornography and what that communicated to the survivors. So I'm going to read two quotes from survivors that we have worked alongside. This survivor was 14 years old, and she said, like my dad would straight up watch porn in the living room while we would all be eating our dinner. My mom didn't say, and there's a cuss word there, so I won't read it. We all watched that, and it was messed up. Finally, from there, my mom was kind of like searching for someone who would love her, but it never seemed to work out. Instead, they wanted me for sex. Then she hated me and kicked me out like I was dirty. Another survivor in terms of talking about how her exposure of, to pornography and how her uh, caretaker viewed pornography served as a risk factor for her stated, pretty much my dad taught me a lot about what men think is important, what was most important about me, and how to survive. He watched porn and he would act that out on me, and he would have my brothers act that out on me, and his friends would act that out on me. So pretty much that was the beginning of my path to running away and then being prostituted or sexually exploited like you guys taught me to see it. He turned me out, but I already knew it, how to do it. 
what all it would involve, you know? So we oftentimes talk about these risk factors and, you know, it can seem far off as though, well, that couldn't happen to me. And I think it's important to realize just the human factors that, that played into these situations of risk. You know, ultimately, we all have things in common. We all desire love. We all desire to be cared for. And so when thinking about what puts folks at risk, what puts specifically young people, vulnerable, marginalized young people at risk for commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking, I think there's some basic questions that we have to ask ourselves. Have we ever wanted attention? Have we ever wanted to belong? Have we ever wanted to be a part of something? Have we ever had a hard time paying for something we wanted? Have we ever felt left out of a situation or that we needed resources? Have we ever had nowhere to go? Have we ever had a time where there was no trusted adult in our lives that we could call for help? When you answer those questions and you think about those that we're serving, um, then surely we can understand risk. So in terms of understanding the impact of commercial sexual exploitation, Human trafficking ultimately entails a cycle of violence, which includes battering, isolation, abandonment, and degradation. Research has, has made estimates that American children are sold an average of 10 to 15 times a day, six days a week, totaling between 9,000 and 14,000 sex acts a year. So surely, we can understand that there's exponential hidden consequences. We can see that on the next slide. There's ultimately a human bio, psychosocial, and spiritual cost. One young survivor that we worked with, and her pseudonym is Abby, and we again changed these names uh, for their protection. She was a 15-year-old female survivor of sex trafficking. And one time when talking about the consequence of sex trafficking and the consequence and how it's hurt her life, she ended up responding to me with these words. I don't even know myself anymore. It's like I became someone else in order to even deal with it, meaning the sex trafficking. And then I was someone else for so long. Now my whole body hurts. You see all these cuts I got on my face? And I got bruises everywhere. My hands, my neck, my back are all stiff and hurt. My feet even hurt. Sometimes I start thinking. I get so stressed my body stiffs up and I can't move at all. But it's more than just my body that hurts. You see, I feel so stressed out. I'm always shaking. I keep blanking out, zoning, going nowhere in my head like I did when I was a trick, when I was with a trick. Even my brain hurts. I ain't the same person anymore. So ultimately what we know is that human trafficking is more than just stressful. When you think about stress, it's a challenge or a condition that forces our regulating physiological and neurophysiologic systems to move outside of their normal dynamic activity. But ultimately, when they're moderate and controllable, it ends up creating resiliency in us as humans. But human trafficking isn't like that. It's unpredictable, it's severe, it's oftentimes prolonged, um, and it causes vulnerability. It increases vulnerability. So again, thinking about human trafficking as trauma it's traumatic due to its unpredictable, extreme, and threatening nature. And so, of course, then this conversation about ACEs is very much relative because when living in that mode of, of fight, flight, or freeze, ultimately the stress circuit breaks down to the, due to fatigue, causing diseases of adaptation. Diseases of adaptation include things like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, peptic ulcers, asthma, arthritis, cancer. I cannot tell you how many survivors that we see that at a young age have things like psoriasis, which is um, a skin disorder, but will end up oftentimes um, over 30% of folks with psoriasis will end up with rheumatoid arthritis. And the research shows that folks that have these early childhood traumas, it can ultimately reduce life expectancy up 
to 20 years. Specifically in terms of research with sex trafficking survivors, we're seeing that survivors describe having headaches, fatigue, dizziness, memory problems, chest pain, stomach pain, and back pain. Additional physiological effects include things like anxiety, eating disorders, self-mutilation, mood swings, insomnia, depression. And commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking has been directly linked to post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Farley did a study where she ended up um, showing that 66% of those sex trafficked suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder in comparison to 20 to 30% of Vietnam vets. And out of 854 survivors across nine countries, she demonstrated that 68% of them met the criteria for complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, what we're seeing is these, these substantial, um, very exponential hidden consequences of sex trafficking that are oftentimes not discussed. So yes, for example, shelter is needed, food is needed, but we have to deal with the more, the deeper, the deeper consequences of sex trafficking that we oftentimes can't see. One of the initial cases that caused us to seek to start the Center for Combating Human Trafficking, when we realized that it, it needed to be more of us that were trained up appropriately across our state and across our country, we were working with a young lady who, um, because of early childhood trauma, significant early childhood trauma, including her mother selling her, her mother was her first exploiter, her first trafficker, she ended up with significant trauma that resulted in hemioleocria, um, which was the bleeding from her eyes and her ears and the stiffening of different parts of her body. So again, if we would have had an earlier intervention with her, for example, where she would have received appropriate treatment and care, there's the potential that we could have um, decreased, decreased that harmful effect. What research is showing is that the death rate of those subjected to exploitation is 40 times higher than the general population, and the average life expectancy is seven years from date of the first experience of CSEC or DMST subjugation. And with that, HIV and AIDS and homicide are the main causes of death. So we are definitely, where, where we're working, seeing these physiological or psychophysiological consequences of sex trafficking. So I would like to take, a, take the time for some discussion with you all. What are some of the psychophysiological consequences you all are seeing manifested with individuals you, you serve who are survivors of CSEC or sex trafficking? I believe we're going to have a word cloud put up. What are some of the psychophysiological consequences you see manifest with individuals you serve who are survivors of commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking? Karen, it appears there's some technical difficulties in pulling out those word clouds. So if you'd like, we can go into the question and answer. Oh, sure, to go ahead and do that instead of, so gather information that way instead of um, through this word cloud. That's fantastic. Great. Um, so we did have a, a, a couple of questions earlier that might help to clarify for folks. Um, one is, if you could clarify the difference between survival sex and survival rape. So we define that term in several of the resources that will be listed at the end of this presentation, and we actually use that term um, interchangeably. And the reason why we use the term rape instead of just sex, because oftentimes you'll hear the term survival sex, um, we're, we're calling it survival rape because 
again, when you say survival sex, there's this connotation of choice or that it's wanted, that it's desired. And in your opinion or in the research you've done, who's more vulnerable to CSEC, uh, girls or boys? In our research, um, we have not been able to break it down simply by sex in terms of boys or girls. There's too many other factors that are associated there. So there's obviously cases where um, a boy may be at greater risk depending on his early childhood vulnerability factors. Uh, it's also depending on the location, his location, his community. Um, it depends on the demand. So again, to make that blanket statement would not be accurate because again, there's too many other factors that come into play. Thank you. It appears that we are going back to the PowerPoint. Okay. And as we're going back to the PowerPoint, there was one more question that just came in. Um, uh, somebody was asking for a definition of what sex tourism is. So sex tourism can um, appear a variety of ways. In the context that I use that term, uh, sex tourism often looks as though, specifically with runaway and homeless youth, when a trafficker takes a truck or a car load or a van load of young people, males and females, and takes them to a variety of uh, different truck stops or different motels, and there's a path that he tours to specifically sell his victims. Thank you. So moving on, again, we kind of we've been talking about uh, the psychophysiological consequences of sex trafficking, and with that, I think it's important to to remember that there's always hope for victims and survivors. Oftentimes, when talking about trafficking, we hear this language of broken and damaged and. I don't believe that any human being was created to remain broken and damaged. And what we know, what we see, is that survivors can overcome and they can live prosperous, healthy, happy lives. And one of the reasons for this is variability in psychophysiological consequences. There's variability in terms of age or due to, excuse me, age, sex, or other unique individual characteristics. So due to the diverse ways in which individuals perceive stress, there are varying um, or various degrees of stress and trauma experienced by sex trafficking victims and survivors. Additionally, each sex trafficking survivor has their own unique psychophysiological response depending up dependent upon genetic predispositions, gender, personality characteristics, social environments, past childhood stress and trauma, the severity of and multiple forms of abuse experienced during sex trafficking length of the sex trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation, and the presence or lack of social supports. So consequently, some but not all survivors will acquire the symptomology of stress-related diseases, those stress-related diseases that we just talked about. So in consideration of the estimates of women and girls subjected to sex trafficking each year, it is important to note that variability in the effects of trauma based on gender and age specifically so for example, women have been found to be twice as likely as men to exhibit symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And while women typically exhibit internalizing symptoms, such as avoidance, dissociation, and anxiety, men usually exhibit externalizing symptoms, such as inattention and hyperactivity, aggression, and impulsivity. Relative to age, Childhood stress and trauma has been found to be a primary environmental factor influencing neurobiological and psychobiological development. And the earlier, earlier the childhood trauma occurs, the more likely that the psychobiological consequences will be severe and cause cumulative impairment, such as psychiatric or addictive disorders, medical illnesses, educational, employment, and familial problems, etc. So all this to say that Survivors of commercial sexual exploitation, often born and raised in an environment fraught with stress and trauma, are more susceptible to further forms of physical and psychophysiological harm. But there is hope. 
again, oftentimes we'll see um, folks serve those who are commercially sex sexually exploited or sex trafficked, sex trafficked, but continue to refer to them as broken. And I guess we kind of have to think about the question, you know, if, is there really any reason to quote unquote rescue someone who is unable to make decisions for themselves or who is so quote unquote broken that they'll never be self-sufficient? No, there is that hope and they can be self-sufficient. When you think about even the current anti-trafficking movement, it is primarily survivors of abuse and exploitation this trafficking that have led the movement. And so it should be the expectation that all victims of abuse and exploitation will lead healthy and prosperous lives. In terms of um, this, this conversation, which I know is a, another level deeper of psychophysiological consequences, I really want to encourage you all, we have an article and there's the link to it at the end of the slideshow. And it's called, It's More Than Just My Body That Got Hurt, The Psychophysiological Consequences of Sex Trafficking. And I really encourage you to check out that resource. We do have a break for questions and answers right now. Hey, Karen, we're going to take a, another question or two. And we have about um, 15 minutes left um, for the rest okay. of the presentation. So there's a quick question about is if you could talk about a good strategy for outreach workers to educate youth and or assess their understanding of trafficking. So how do we, when we're out on the streets working with young people, help to educate them and or assess where they are about the understanding? Again, I would really encourage you if, if you don't, I would first of all encourage you to reach out to many or the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. We do have resources that can help you with that. But also, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to um, break down your local definitions as well as the federal definitions, thinking about action, means, and purpose, and consider ways to gather that information in a relational um, discussion, that you're not just going up to somebody and asking them blatant questions about whether or not they're selling sex or someone is forcing them to do something or oftentimes um, folks who are squares or who have not been abused or exploited through trafficking will think that they can use street lingo and I would tell you that it's been our experience that most of people, most of the folks that we've worked with, survivors that we do work with, um, would not be responsive. So for example, we oftentimes hear folks who have, who have not been through that form of abuse and exploitation talk about, quote unquote, the life or the game. And again, I would encourage you not to ask folks um, questions with that language if you have not been a part of the life. Great, Karen, thank you. Um, I think we should go ahead and just move forward because we have about 15 minutes left. Excellent. So we've talked about risk and the psychophysiological consequences of sex trafficking, but this last, last part that we have, we just want to talk a little bit about recognizing strengths and resiliencies. I love, when I think about strengths and resiliencies, it's hard for me not to think about the quote by Booker T. Washington, and he stated that there is a certain class of race problem solvers who don't want the patient to get well, because as long as the disease holds out, they have not only an easy means of making a living, but also an easy, easy medium through which to make themselves prominent before the public. So again, if, if it's not about us, and it's really about um, helping people become who they were created to be, we have to identify and then apply strengths and protective factors. And some of those strengths and protective factors you'll see on the next slide um, are things that include both internal strengths and resilience factors, as well as external strengths and resilience factors, or protective factors. Things like caring relationships, um, being in relationships where there are high expectation messages, so um, hopes for what that victim or survivor might become, and an expectation that they'll achieve that, and that there's opportunity for that survivor to participate in activities and contribute with real strengths, that strengths aren't just words about uh, superficial things that they're good at, but, but that it includes a true recognition of strengths that they can apply. So similar to the way in which we did research on risk factors, we also did research on resilience factors with 258 survivors, and we asked them, what do you believe helped you survive and exit trafficking? And in a similar fashion, and we can see this on the table, or the context map that you have on your slides, 
Ultimately, the possession or obtainment of layers of resilience factors assist in protecting young people even in a vulnerable state. And an increase in the number of resilience factors both decreases the youth, youth vulnerability to CSEC or domestic sex trafficking and or also assists in the ability for a youth to survive and even strive through domestic sex trafficking subjugation. And we broke these into three different categories. And so the resilience factors we could categorize as individual characteristics and traits, individual adaptations, or individual resources, specifically internal and external resources. So in terms of some of these individual characteristics and traits, some of the resilience factors we found were things like a positive view of self, so a sense of self-efficacy, a belief that they could deal effectively um, with tasks in their lives, a sense of self-agency, so the capacity for that survivor to coordinate learning skills, knowledge, emotions, motivation in order to actually do something, like reach a goal. A sense of self-worth and self-confidence. Another resilience factor we found was the, um, the possession of insight, so the ability to conceptualize their traumatic experience as an opportunity for growth or maybe even as a strength. So for example, when survivors were able to utilize their story to do something positive, so again, when they view their self as a survivor. Additional resilience factors that we found were things like being future focused, so the ability to plan and set goals for the future, a feeling that they could have influence over their environment, a common theme that regularly got brought up with survivors was this ability to envision an alternative life and a belief that not only that they could envision it, but a belief that they deserved it. And with that, having educational and career aspirations was truly key. Another resilience factor was even disassociation, which is oftentimes uh, talked about in a clinical setting as negative. But multiple survivors talked about their ability to disassociate as a survival strategy. Other resilience factors that came up in our interviews and in our research were things like social support, so relationship with non-judgmental and supportive individuals, relationships with non-parental parental adults, such as a mentor, the ability to talk to adults about problems, and connection to school or an extracurricular activity. In addition, religion and spirituality and the belief in helping others or giving back were also mentioned as resilience factors. So when thinking about how do we as, as providers build resilience in others, specifically in those who have survived and um, who are overcoming CSEC or sex trafficking, we need to consider their long-term holistic needs, not just those short-term needs of, of food and clothing and shelter. And we need to implement victim-centered survivor-led care. You know, ultimately, services can't stop after the quote-unquote rescue. We have to think about who will walk and, and really live with a survivor long-term. That's really when the work begins. And in terms of implementing victim-centered survivor-led care, we have to treat survivors with dignity and respect, as though they are the experts of their own lives. And we need to seek ways to empower and encourage survivor ownership in the treatment. We need to provide services that are non-judgmental and empathetic, strengths-based, survivor-informed. And we need to realize that each individual or each survivor is an individual and that they have very unique needs as a survivor. And with that, we need to recognize their strength, dignity, and worth. So ways that we can increase resiliency is by providing opportunities to develop leadership skills allowing opportunities for choice, and whenever possible, searching for ways to provide the survivor with some amount of control over their environment. To encourage future planning, we can have discussions about dreams and future aspirations. We can assist survivors in goal-setting activities where they're actually at the table, talking about what they want. In terms of life skills, we can assist survivors in developing life skills like problem solving, communication skills, self-awareness and empathy, effective coping skills, and how to advocate for themselves as well as others. With this, it's really important. We oftentimes will think about street life in negative terms, 
So when having discussions with survivors, it's critical that you try to find out um, what positive thing was coming from that perhaps maladaptive or negative coping strategy and turn that around for good. We can increase resiliency through educational opportunities. Again, providing mentors and examples of success stories. Talking about ways to access or ensure access to education, like scholarships, loans, grants. Oftentimes they won't even know how to access those things. And another way we increase resiliency is by enhancing their connections. Oftentimes their worldview is um, very small. It is with those that they have been exploited by or exploited with. And so it's important to, to enhance their connection and their worldview and, and show them that there is another way of life. Provide, we can also provide them with a secure base to help them develop trust in other people. Organize, we could organize opportunities for them to give back to others in the community. And we can encourage the exploration of new hobbies interests, and interests. You know, at the center, we always say that you know, when people are in a chronic state of quote unquote poverty, such as the holistic, biopsychosocial, spiritual poverty that occurs in cases of abuse and exploitation and trafficking, development of the person is the appropriate intervention. But yet what we often see done is this quote unquote rescue or relief. While relief is done for people, develop means, development means that we have to walk with the people, encouraging them that individual, that survivor that we're intending to help to use their gifts and resources to contribute to their own progress. And the biggest, the most important way we can do this is through transformational relationships. Relationships that are committed, relationships that offer safety and predictability, that offer grace and forgiveness, and relationships that recognize that in the same way there was a complex process that led them to that exploitation, there's going to be a complex process of healing. As Kristen mentioned when we first got started today, one of the ways we've really seen this work is through, is built, through building resiliency um, with mentoring relationships. Ultimately, mentoring offers a restorative relationship, and it encourages growth and healing and expands social supports and connections. In these relationships, it's important that we uh, work to apply and further develop the unique strengths of individuals who have survived CSEC and domestic sex trafficking. And it's important that we do this at an individual level, at an agency level, and as well as at a community level. That again, we recognize the strengths in that person. We try to figure out ways to help them apply that within our agency, and then that we connect them with other folks in the community to help support growth and healing. This includes things like connecting them to education and employment and other interests they might have. So we have one last question, if that is working. Karen, we're not going to do any word clouds, because I think that's where we're um, running into that problem. Okay then I will um, wrap up with just some actions and resources that we have. I think one thing that's true for all of us when we think about what we can do in the anti-trafficking movement is just continuously assess and develop ourselves. Um, I always say we're all wounded healers. And so as wounded healers, we have to first seek to, to heal ourselves, be aware of ourselves and what we need to work on, and engage in self-care consistently, we need to continuously seek education, wisdom, and accountability. You know, I, I know that I make mistakes. I've definitely made many, many mistakes over the last couple of decades of doing this work and continue to make mistakes. So it's important to surround ourselves with other people who will tell us the truth and love, as we say, um, and, and have a variety of survivor leaders that have unique experiences, as well as people who have professional advocacy and academic expertise and knowledge. It's important that we invest in our time, talent, and treasure in a way that really makes sense. Um, you know, we have a variety of folks who engage with the Center for Combating Human Trafficking, and oftentimes they come to us with a desire to 
directly work with a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation, for example. And what we oftentimes do is engage them in a process where we figure out what they're good at and then help them apply that. Because perhaps it doesn't make sense um, that they're working with a, a survivor. For example, um, we've had folks that, that will tell them, you know, actually, you're a really great accountant. And so instead of teaming you up or partnering you or helping you develop a relationship with a survivor, why don't you come and teach a class once a month where you talk about budgeting and accounting? And then ultimately, each and every day, we need to strive to do no harm and empower survivor voice. It's critical within this movement right now, um, I believe, that we make sure that there's space and that there's a platform for survivor leaders and overcomers of commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. We can all deepen our understanding to understand how your community and your state is addressing CSEC and human trafficking. And then we really encourage you to foster conversations about how your community can support growth and healing of victims and survivors, again. And with, with survivors and overcomers uh, beside you, we really encourage that you raise awareness within your communities. We have a few resources listed here to help you deepen your understanding. Specifically, many and the Wichita State University Center for Combating Human Trafficking has developed some resources. The first one is Shining Light on the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. And this is a toolkit that we have up. And if you click on this, it should link you directly to that toolkit. We also recently wrote a blog on how mentoring supports the healing journey for victims and survivors of commercial sexual exploitation. We have the National Human Trafficking Hotline and Resource Center link here as well as well as two other resources, Mentoring for Youth with Backgrounds of Involvement in Commercial Sex Activity and the Federal Strategic Action Plan on Services for Victims of Human Trafficking in the U.S. There's also a link here for the Institute of Medicine's report, Confronting Commercial Sexual Exploitation and Sex Trafficking of Minors in the United States. And then, as I've mentioned a couple times throughout the presentation, there's several resources here, um, and these these are our sources of information for this webinar. We do welcome intentional partnership. And so feel free to reach out to me, Dr. Karen countryman Roseworm at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. Our website is there. Our phone number is there. My assistant, Bailey Patton Bracken, her email is there, as well as our general email. Feel free to follow us also on Facebook and Twitter. And as we wrap up today, I just want to leave you a quote. Again, um, you know, we oftentimes want to engage in short-term responses, and other times we want to just change law, and we think that that's the end all. But what we see with any social justice movement, it's, it's more complex than that. And we have to strive to implement adaptive solutions. Ultimately, the truth is that until education is ignorant of economic access, until opportunity is blind to race and sex, and until justice is unaware of social status, the decriminalization of children and families who lack alternatives beyond labor or sex trafficking will be a proclamation, but not a fact. The recognition that those subjected to human trafficking are victims of abuse and exploitation will be in vain. And the rescue of trafficked persons will represent no more than an exchange in the power and ownership over those vulnerable and marginalized. I thank each and every one of you for making the difference in in the lives of those who are at risk of or who have been subjected to or who have survived and overcome commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. I want to thank Karen for the presentation today. And I appreciate everyone's time in participating in this webinar and in this conversation. Um, we do not have time to take additional questions, but we have gathered your questions in the question and answer pod, and we plan on responding to those questions and sending that back out to everybody that was registered so that you have the opportunity to get your questions answered. Um, you had Karen's information, and here's the information for many. If you need to get a hold of us, please do. I'm going to hand it now back to our hosts at NITEC.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to our presenters um, on this great for a great discussion on this topic. We would like to apologize for any audio issues you experienced throughout the call. And we really appreciate everyone's um, patience as we work to resolve the problem. We have just a few brief reminders. Um, this webinar will be archived in OJDP's online university in approximately three weeks. Um, and for more information, of course, contact many. Um, and you may also contact OJDP or NTAC um, via help desk with the following contact information on the slide. And lastly, we would, like to pre we would um, really appreciate if you could please take five minutes to complete the feedback survey. Um, and just thank you again for joining us today, and have a great afternoon, everyone.